at the Smith Act trial, delivered by Elizabeth Gurley Lynn, on April 24th of 1952 in New York. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. I am a defendant in this case, acting as my own attorney, and therefore have the opportunity to address you directly. It is unusual for a defendant to represent oneself. But my comrade, Mr. Pettis Perry, and I have elected to do so. Neither of us is a liar. We will speak to you in the language of laymen and women, should I say. We are both common pleaders, proudly and avowedly. We are all qualified to explain to you what the Communist Party of the USA really stands for, what it advocates, what its day-by-day -day activities are, and what are its ultimate aims. We will try to do so in simple, non-technical language. We will prove to you that we are not a criminal conspiracy, but a 33-year-old working-class political party devoted to the immediate needs and aspirations of the American people, the advancements of the workers, farmers, and the Negro people, to the preservation of the democracy and culture, and to the advocacy of socialism. Our ideas may be new and strange to you. Probably you have never seen or met a communist before. We don't ask you to agree with us, but to listen with an open mind and not to accept as gospel truth the sensational tales of stool pigeons and plundered agents who will be the government chief, if not sole, witness. Centuries ago, Judas became the symbol of such infamy, a forerunner of those who join a group of sincere and honest people, advocate its teachings, carry out its practices, only to betray it. We will prove to you that we who stand ready to make extreme sacrifices for what we believe are giving you a true picture of the purposes of the Communist Party. It is customary for the client to be introduced to the jury in or his or her attorney. I am my own attorney. I must therefore introduce myself. I am an American of Irish descent. My father, Thomas Flynn, was born in Maine. My mother, Anne Gurley, was born in Galway, Ireland. I was born in Concord, New Hampshire, 62 years ago. I was married in 1908, separated from my husband shortly thereafter, and I've always used my own name. My only son, Fred, died in 1940 at the age of 29 from a chest cancer. I reside with my sister, who is a retired school teacher. We have lived in New York City for the past 52 years. My mother was a skilled tailor. My father, a quarry worker who worked his way through the engineering school at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. My father, grandfather, and all my uncles were members of labor unions. To countries, ladies, and gentlemen, one of the essential issues in my case is my individual intent. The intent with which I joined the Communist Party and have remained a member of it, and the intent with which I have tried to carry out its program. My intent has been shaped out in my earlier experiences and my reaction to the conditions of life, especially the conditions of the worker. By showing you what my intent is and what in my life shaped the intent, I shall show you that never have I and not now do I intend to advocate the overthrow of the government by force or violence, nor do I intend to bring about such overthrow. I come from a family whose day-by-day -day diet included important social issues of the day, and from this I early learned to question things as which we seek improvement. Thus my mother advocated the woman's suffrage, and my father and mother and my father and mother discussed with their children the campaigns of Debs, the socialist candidate for president. My father read aloud to me and my, to my brother and sister such books as the Communist Manifesto and other writings of Marx and Engels, which the government will use as evidence in this trial. It was a serious, I was a serious child, due probably to these child impressions, which are my background to the affiliations and the extreme youth of the socialist movement and in my mature years with the Communist Party. 
times were hard. We were poor. My first experience with discrimination was in Manchester, New Hampshire, when my father ran for city engineer about 1895. I heard it said he was defeated because he was Irish. He was very bitter on the subject and told us of science and factories when he was a boy. No Irish need apply. Our parents opposed all forms of national, religious, or color discrimination, which will prove is identical with the position of the Communist Party today and form the basis of the position I take today in the Communist Party. My first knowledge of the meaning of the imperialism, which will be an issue in this case, was a vivid recollection of my father's opposition to the Spanish-American War and his insistence on the right of the Cuban-Philippine peoples to their independence. He joined an anti-imperialist league to protest against our country, embarking on the evil path of imperialism, which we will prove began at that time. The conditions in the textile towns of New Hampshire and Massachusetts contributed to my later joining the Communist Party, which, as Mr. Lane says, concentrates on the recruiting of the workers in industry. Huge gray mills, like prisons, barrack-like company boarding houses, long hours, low wages, long periods of slack, the prosperous owner lived in the center of the atoms, Massachusetts, and rode around in this fine carriage with its beautiful horses. I saw lard instead of butter on neighbors' tables. Children fought underwear in the cold New England winters, a girl scaled by an unguarded machine in the mill across the street from our school. I saw an old man weeping as they put him into a lockup at a tramp. Then we came to live in the drab South Bronx, near the New Haven Railroad's roundhouse, in a cold water, unheated, gaslit flat. Casualties and accidents were high among the railroad workers. Children were maintained as they gathered the coal in the yards in bad times. My mother helped women in the neighborhood who could not afford a doctor when a baby came. Yes, I was greatly troubled by this. Why did good, hard-working people suffer so? Why were men who were willing, able, and anxious to work denied jobs. Why was there so much unemployment? Why were there rich people who apparently did little but enjoyed life? I hated poverty. I saw my mom humiliated when the unpaid um, grocery bills could not be met and the landlord stood at the door demanding his rent. I joined the debating society in PS9 in the Lower Bronx. I won a medal in the debate on the subject. Should the government own the mines? I said, yes it should. This was during the great Ansarite site coal strike in 1902. I attended the Bronx Socialist Meeting in 1905, later at the Harlem Socialist Club at 125th Street. My speaking cancer started in 1906 on the ambitious subject of women under the socialism. Naturally, I drew heavily on the offers of miracle women like Charlotte Pentingle and the Susan B. Anthony. Also on a book about the American women like Charlotte Pentingle and Susan B. Anthony. Also on a book written in 1872 by Augustus Bebel, a socialist member of the German Reichstag, written while he was in prison under Bismarck's anti-socialist law. It was first published here by the Socialist Labour Party in 1904. I am puzzled to see it on the government's list of documents. What relation the House to this instrument is hard to fathom unless to advocate the full political, economic, and social emancipation of women has become a form of advocacy of the overthrow of the government by force and violence under the government's interpretation of the Smith Act. But of this historic and economic study, which is very much out of date today, is to be definely too combed for sentences which torn out of a context can distort its meaning. This, we will prove, can be done to any book, no matter what its purpose, even to the Bible, Shakespeare, or Gray's Anatomy. My youthful admission, believe it or not, was to be a constitutional lawyer. Instead, I became a labor organizer. Then it was called an agitator, or, by the press, one who stirred up people. I was determined to do something about the bad conditions under which our family and all around us suffered. I have to be stuck to that purpose for 46 years. I consider it 
in so doing, I have become a good American. I have spent my life among the American workers all over this country, slept in their homes, eaten at their tables. They are a majority of the people who have the Indian legal rights in our view to govern the country. We mean by workers, all who do have the Indian legal right in our view to govern our country. We mean by workers, all who are useful or hard or brain. My life work began when I joined the IWW Industrial Workers of the World in 1906, a pioneer in the industrial union which flashed like a great comet across the horizon of the American labor movement for nearly two decades. I returned as an IWW organizer in 1912 to New England, my birthplace, where the IWW led historical textile strikes in Lawrence Lowell and Ned Broad, Massachusetts. The strikes were unorganized, largely foreign-born men and women whose wages were cut when their hours were reduced by the Massachusetts law. In 1913, I was a leader in the Partisan, New Jersey Silk Strike. In 1916, in a strike of the iron ore miners on the Mesbra Range in Minnesota, where the mines are owned by the U.S. Street Trust, I will attempt to prove to you that it is not the communist who advocate and use force and violence. I saw it used in all of these labor struggles, not by the workers, but by police, company guards, and state militia. I saw workers' club beaten and shot down. I spoke. My travels as a communist speaker have taken me all over the country. I saw the fruits of a lawless, aggressive, brutal, and ruthless capitalism which gained my profit for a few at the expense of the many. Our country is a rich and beautiful country, fully capable of producing plenty for all, educating its youth and caring for its aged. We believe it could be done under socialism. I saw a great forest cut down and the huge land left with the blackened stumps, miles of topsoil blown and washed away, and fertile fields became like a desert. I've seen the textile workers who wore beautiful woven and woolen fabrics shivering for lack of warm clothing, and coal miners living in the cold shacks in the company towers, and steel towns that were armed camps. I saw men blacklisted, driven from town to town, forced to change their names because they had dared to try to organize a union. We will prove to you that it is not the communists who have advocated or practiced force and violence, but that it is the employing class which has done both throughout the history of my life in the American labor movement. Like General Sherman Bell, who said in Colorado during a minor strike to hell with Heaba's corpus, We'll give them post-mortems. We will prove to you that we will prove to you that it is nor we who wants the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but that has has always been done by the employing class. We will prove that we are fighting here for our constitutional and democratic rights, not to advocate force and violence, but to expose and stop its use against the people. We will demonstrate that in fighting for our rights, we believe that we are defending the constitutional rights of all Americans. We believe we are acting as good Americans. Since six out of eleven of my writings in political affairs listed by the government deal with what is called defense, I will prove to you that this has been part of my work since 1907, before there was a Communist Party. For example, I distributed thousands of copies of the famous document in the 20s called Illegal Practices of the Department of Justice, which is not among the government's exhibits of old-time documents, but I will gladly offer to the jury. It was signed by a 12 of the most prominent lawyers of that period, including professors Frank Furter and the Chaffee of Harvard and Francis Fisher King, who signed his post as the United States Attorney in Philadelphia in protests such as these proceedings. I early engaged in struggles to win free speech on the, on the streets and in the halls. This early identification and identification with civil liberties led to my becoming a charter member of the American Civil Liberties Union in 1907. 
and later the organizer of the Workers' Defense Union, a delegate body from unions and fraternal organizations which furnished legal defense and political and labor prosecutions. We have plenty to do during the Infinite 1920 Palmer Red Race. We defended socialism. I defended socialists. I worked for seven years in the unsuccessful struggles to save the lives of Sacco and Vanafiti. In the government's list of exhibits is an article I wrote in August 1947 entitled Sacco and Vanzetti 20 years after, in which I pointed out the worldwide belief in their innocence. Now I will show you how and why I left the IWW and joined the Communist Party. This bears directly on the issue on the forcible overthrow of the government that Mr. Lane spoke to you about this morning. After careful reflection, it became clear to me that the IWW was an anarcho-syndialistic anarcho organization. The IWW wanted to bring socialism within capitalism and then break through the spell and the shell of capitalism by the general strike and seizing and possession of the industry. Now it was precisely this position that I rejected. I came to the conclusion that socialism could be achieved, not by one of its fault or violence, but by the persistent political activities of the workers and the people. And so in order to participate in the political activities in the efforts to achieve socialism, I joined the Communist Party. In doing this, I got back into the labor movement and stopped being what then I decided was anarchistic. As the origins of the Communist Party, we will show here that they were developed within the Socialist Party and organized left-wing movement until by 1919, it was the majority of the party. At the Chicago Convention of the Socialist Party, where was a split occurred. The left-wing, injected by the police, reorganized as the Communist Party. The left-wing was the majority of the old Socialist Party. All my social friends and associates were left-wingers. I was in great sympathy with them. By 1926, I had become convinced that the Communist Party was the logical inheritor of all the best traditions. History and struggles of the older socialist movements and the IWW too, I was ready to join the party and give an application to Charles Rutenberg, then the secretary of the Communist Party, in 1926. Due to a sudden death a few weeks later during the most critical period in my own illness, that application was apparently lost. Anyhow, I was never presented to the party. I was ill and heart trouble in the Portland, Oregon at that time. While there, I was in constant touch with my old friends, Anna Weir and Bloor and Anita Whitney of California, both communist leaders. Naturally, my heart and mind Although I was ill, I was deeply moved into the current political problems of the people, the menace of fascism in Europe, the great struggles of unemployment led by communist fosters, Amta, Mina, Dennis, and others. Later, the new unions, which were present during the New Deal of President Roosevelt. Miss Whitney bought me a daily worker in the fall of 1975 with a speech by George Dimitrov called the United Front Against the War and Fascism, which the government has stated it intends offering in evidence. This speech made a deep impression on me. We will show the character of the communist work in the struggle against fascism in answer to the clarion call of Dimitrov, who died in 1949 as a premier on his country. We will show the background of his speech, which is essential in order for you to understand its meaning and the intent for which I had joined the Communist Party. This was the time of the rise of fascism, which will show seemed very remote to most people in our countries in the 30s. People laughed at Hitler and Mussolini as demagogues and multibanks, but it caused great concern to the peoples of Europe, especially to the communists in this country that regularly affected or threatened. George Dimitrov was a Bulgarian communist who had been in exile in Germany and while there was sprayed an infamous Reichstag fire case. Dimitrov was freed. He took refuge in the Soviet Union, where he delivered the speech in 1935 
at the Congress of the Communist International. It is an eloquent and dramatic appeal to fight fascism, which he describes as the most vicious enemy of mankind. It is addressed to the communists especially and other progressive people elsewhere to put aside all immediate partisan or secretarian interests or differences or ultimate political aims to unite to stop fascism. We will prove that this is what it is meant to be a united front. The policy brought communists together with all other honest and patriotic people who were determined to save their country from the ravages of fascism. We will show that Hank Forbes, one of our party organizers, who might otherwise be here a defendant, lost his life at Anzio Beachhead in the pursuance of that policy, as did hundreds of, of American communists in World War II. The result when I read this powerful appeal here is where I belong, and as soon as I am well, I will again apply to join the Communist Party. I did so. William Z. Foster, whom I first met in 1909 in the IWW, and Ella Reeve Boer, whom I knew from the old Socialist Party, presented my application in the winter of 1936 and 1937. It was accepted and publicly announced in the press. In my extreme youth, I had affiliated myself with the non-political IWW. In my maturity, I came back into the working class movement of socialism. This may seem a very lengthy introduction, but I have tried to draw out conclusions from my biography on the issues in this case. It is not intended to be personal, but an explanation of how and why I became a communist. And I am an example, not an exception. Now, as to my official position in the Communist Party, which I gladly and proudly acknowledge, they are a matter of public record. In 1978, I become and am today a member of the National Committee of the Communist Party. The National Committee was reduced in 1948 to 13. The actual members are William Z. Foster, our chairman, who has been seriously ill for several years, and my dear comrades, the 11 common leaders convicted under the Smith Act, which they challenged as unconstitutional. I have also been the chairman of the Women's Committee of the Communist Party since 1945, which the evidence will show carries on struggles for equal rights for the women in the shops, unions, and all organizations even, including our own party when necessary. My comrade Claudia Jones, a defendant here, is the executive secretary. We have worked together, spoken together, written to help organize women for full equality, both politically and economically, for the building of movements for peace, consumer councils, parent teacher organizations, and similar organizations, for the unity of Negro and white women, and to overcome the exploitation of Negro women as workers, as women, as Negroes. Mayor Kurt Coles, which both of us have written on the subject, are feared in the government's list of exhibits. We will demonstrate to you how constructive and beneficial is the nature of our work among women, inspiring them to be the greater self-confidence, greater comradeship with one another, greater participation in the public affairs. The evidence will show further that we used the organization of the women for the political activity, not only on election day, but for the years around, and hearings, delegations, petitions, and statements to all the legislative and public bodies on such issues as childcare, better school, better housing, a better standard of living, etc. We have written of the history of the movement in our country, where every right we now enjoy has been won only by the organized struggle. The right of women to vote, to serve on juries, productive labor legislation for women workers, mothers' pensions, and so forth. We have directed our sharpest criticism to the virtual disfranchisement of the southern Negro women by force and violence, and through the pool tax, discrimination against the women in the factories, lack of upbringing, etc. We have advocated as a system of society best guaranteeing to women full equal rights in all spheres ensuring them to be the possibility of exercising these rights. I remind you again that we are not asking you to agree with us, but will prove to you that we have not been advocating force and violence, but rather a peaceful and happy world. I've also been the chairman of the Defense Committee of the party since 1948, 
when our leaders previously referred to them and were arrested. The evidence will show that our duties, my duties, were to raise funds necessary for the adequate legal defense of our members who might be arrested on the Smith Act or held for deportation under the McCarran Act. Individual communists are financially able to defend themselves. These duties are ours. Our duties were to publicize the facts in the case. Since newspaper coverage is notoriously inadequate and invariably prejudiced to organized mass meetings, arrange tours for the speakers, and generally call for public support for their defense. In addition, the governor's list of documents, which they told us they would introduce in this case, or indicated that they would introduce in the case, makes clear to you, will make clear to you that I am a columnist of the Daily Worker. This is correct. For 15 years, from 1937 to the date, I have produced at least two columns a week, besides many feature articles for the Sunday Piper, The Worker. These are my personal columns and are not submitted to the editorial staff in advance. Praise or criticism comes from the readers. Some of my columns and articles are listed by the government as government's exhibits, which they intend to introduce. If they are to prove my official position in our party, or my tours around the country, or that I spoke in the specific places, or that I invited people to join the Communist Party, the government need not waste its time. I do not deny any of those things. The evidence will show that I ask people to join it. I believe in the party to which I belong. It is a legal party, in my estimation, devoted to the best interest of the people. And I would not belong to it if I would hesitate to ask my honest persons to join me. Hundreds did so at my invitation. I would be glad to make it available to the jury at the appropriate time, not just if you aren't close, carefully called by the government's purpose, but all of them dealing with a vast range of subjects. I will prove to you thereby that there is no advocacy of the force and violence in any one of them. I've also written a dozen pamphlets during the past period covered by the indignant. One is called Stool Pigeon, another The Plot to Gather in America. The government did not listen and list them for your attention, I recommend especially that you do read one of the listed documents it is which I presented. The eloquent and able opening remarks of Eugene Dennis, General Secretary of the Communist Party. And there he stands, as I am standing now, defending himself before another jury, when he stood here as I am standing now. It is called the case for the Communist Party. The government that has indicated it, that it intends offering it an evidence possible for this reason. I am glad that the government will make it available to you and would be happy to follow congressional examples and ask that this speech of Eugene Dennis be considered as an extension to one of my remarks. I hand those advertisements and press clippings relative to the hundreds of public mass meetings arranged by the Communist Party at which I and other defendants have spoken in the past 15 years. We will prove that nowhere has there been any advocacy of force and violence. The subject matter of such meetings should interest this jury. I believe, however, as evidence of our intent. Take it random, the struggle against the taft Hartley Law, the rights of the Negro people. I and other defendants have spoken during the period covered by the indictment and previously on the radio, especially in the political campaigns and in support of the communists and other candidates, including Councilman Kakion and Davis, and for Simon W. Gerson, a defendant present here, when he was a candidate after Mr. Kakion's sudden death. We will prove to you that the Communist Party, USA, is not as the indictment sets forth. A society, group, or assembly of persons, but it is a legitimate political party. It has nominated candidates for all public offices, including that of president. We will prove that defendants here on trial have been candidates and more substantially high votes. Perry, Gerson, Begun, Johnson, Weinstein, and Weinstock. I ran with Mr. Benjamin J. Davis for Congress at large in 1942, and we each received over 50,000 votes. Our campaign slogans or program for victory was, Not an idle man, not an idle machine, not an idle acre. 
Mr. Garson received 157 votes in Brooklyn in 1948. One of the defendants in the current Los Angeles Smith Act trial, a known communist, Miss Bernadette Doyle, received over 600,000 votes for a statewide office as a peace candidate. Our evidence will prove how the Communist Party operates politically. We are a party of a new type in that we are not before the people just to capture their votes. We will prove that these that we are about politically active the year round. We have attended public hearings of the communist spokesman. For instance, I appeared with Mr. Gerson before the Senate Judiciary Committee to oppose the appointment of Tom Clark to the Supreme Court. Now, our party, along with other minority parties, were not ever hampered by ever-increasing electoral restrictions and barred from the ballot in some states. We believe firmly we would win many more votes and elect candidates to Congress. Communists are represented in parliaments of all major non-fascist countries in the world today. This is the arena where political views belong, in the marketplace of public discussion to be passed upon solely by the electorate of our country. The government obviously intends to make much of the fact that occasionally we spoke in somebody else's home a selected group of people. In reference to such house gatherings and somewhat purely social, we will show that these are some of the reasons. Not like it was because no hall could be rented in a small one in the street tones, like steel, coal, and textiles, people seen at a communist meeting by company spies would lose their jobs and be blacklisted, and even the unions would not be able to protect these members. Sometimes we held them in homes for convenience of women who could not attend otherwise. Sometimes it was for the protection of the Negroes, especially in the South and Border State areas, that the Speaker goes to them rather than expecting them to come to the Speaker. We will show what we consider it our duty as Communists to protect workers, members and non-members alike, from harassment, loss of jobs, threats of violence, or FBI surveillance, and just because they come to our meetings. Whatever possible our meetings were open with the public and the press invited, sometimes, unfortunately, communists are driven to privacy as protection against persecution. Criticism should not be directed to us, but at those who created the repressive conditions, which will be proof, forces workers to choose between their jobs and their beliefs. We will prove, and I can assure you, that no member of a party what who would be happy and willing to publicly declare his or her membership if the same rights and protections were accorded to us all others engaged in political activity in our country. The government will also make much of school, as Mr. Lane has already indicated, where Marxism-Leninism was taught. I gave lectures at certain schools in New York City, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and at a national training school. My topic for either History of the Labor Movement or History of the Women's Movement in the USA. I have outlined which I use in these courses, which are analytical and explanatory, and I will, because they are only brief, I will offer them an evidence in this case. A course on the History of the American Labor Movement, delivered at the Jefferson School of New York, is presented here as the overt act of Mr. Louis Weinstock. This brings us to the skeleton upon which this case is built, a strange new type of overt act, suggestive, if I may say so, of Nazi book burning. They set forth. They set forth, we believe, activities which are the ordinary everyday acts of all organizations and individuals who seek to present their views in the marketplace of ideas. Of 29 overt acts, 11 are articles in the magazine Political Affairs, 5 are daily worker articles, Five, including mine, are public meetings. Two are committee meetings. Two are classes. One is thieving a building. One is mailing letters. One is writing a pamphlet. And one is becoming a party organizer. The governor will attempt to clothe them too, I presume, in so-called AOSPism language. Or no matter what we said, we will mean and will be meant its opposite. It is called like a Houdini-like performance to say peace to a mass meeting of 10,000 people and mean war. Mr. Perry and I and our co-defendants will try in the evidence we submit as this case progresses to cut through the maze of what we consider misrepresentations in relation to the ESPN language and to make clear what that was 
that we say that we mean and we mean what we say and that the language of the Marxism and Leninism is not as mysterious or obscure as the government attempts to make it sound. All sciences, even the law, have their own terminology, but like a doctor's prescription, this does not mean they are a dishonest or misleading to the general public. Not a single act of violence is alleged against any one of us. Not to larger charges that I know of thus far that any of us collectively or individually advocated the forceful overthrow of the United States government. The science of Marxism-Leninism, which is expounded in the books as evidence, had its origins over a century ago with two great political thinkers, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. In a few words, that there is a danger of oversimplification of a specific scientific subject. They declare that what happens to humanity is not a matter of the blind fate, nor the will of the great men, nor must it be accepted as irrevocable. They said mankind can find a scientific explanation for wars, famine, economic depression, and poverty, and that mankind, especially the working class, can help to change the society, can alter and direct the course of history, can abolish these classes, and can help to change the society and the evils and the institutes as a planned social order. Based on the well-being of all. After profound analysis of all human history, and especially in the present stage known as capitalism, they use a few books and an investmental part of its application. These scientific series were not fixed and at a final at the death of the Marx and Engels, who never considered them a dogma. Like all sciences, they have expanded and have been modified by <clears throat> subsequent developments. Other students and writers took up where they left off, particularly V. I. Lenin, a giant intellect and a great man who suffered exile and imprisonment under the Russian Tsar. He turned with beloved country to lead the workers and the peasants to free themselves from Tsarist tyranny and exploitation. Lenin enriched Marxism by his studies, especially his analysis of new social conditions brought about by the rise of imperialism and the advent of the socialist. Marxist Leninist writings today fill thousands of books in all known languages and would more than fill this courtroom from floor to ceiling. They are studied by millions of people throughout the world, but we will prove to you that there are great beacons of light and are not blueprints, are not hard and fast divisive, but are only a guide, modified to conform to the developments of history and to the new social conditions. Programs, media programs, are their applications. We hold that political theories are not triable in a court of law under our established American tradition. No jury's verdicts can decide their merit. Only the people can do that. We have believed that under the Bill of Rights, we have a right to advocate our views. But since our ideas are here on trial, we feel we have a secret duty to ourselves and to our party to adequately defend them out of any slander or distortion. We contend that the Americans have a right to speak their minds on any subject. We communists have a right to defend socialism or the evolution of the capitalist system and the economy and of the private ownerships of the means of life and all the people. We will prove that such a change cannot be achieved when the majority of the American people are ready and willing to make it. And that the communist party does not advocate force and violence to effect such a change. We will try to prove to you during this trial the meaning of the working class interpretism, the internationalism which the government will use to bolster up their theory or foreign agent. Abraham Lincoln said the strongest bond of human sympathy outside the family relation should be one uniting all working people of all nations and tongues by kindred. Both May Day and International Women's Day, we will prove, have their origins here in the United States, even though they are now celebrated internationally. In the spirit of such solidarity, I will show that I made street trips abroad in which, except for the visits to Canada, 
for my first outside the USA. The occasions for a Congress of Women, held in 1945, the 80th birthday of Marcel Chachi, editor of the Communist Daily Paper of Paris, the Night in 1949, and to cover the convention of the French Communist Party in 1950, where I was received as a fraternal delegate from our American party and invited to deliver its greetings. On this last trip, I visited London over a weekend, spoke at the London District Communist Party Conference, and visited the grave of Karl Marx. You will undoubtedly hear evidence from the government of my first trip to Europe. The International Congress of Women was held in 1945, before the ashes of war were cold. Women participated from all the Allied countries, the Soviet Union, England, France, Italy, Hungary, and others. Many had just been released from the concentration camps and the prisons. Ravensbrück, Usenwald, Ostrich. We met women there who had been in the Soviet Army Air Forces, who had been in charge of the railroads, who were executives of the industry and reconstruction, women who came from a socialist country. We met Spanish women in exile, some who come out of Spain at the risk of their lives. A congress held in Paris without heat, with flickering lights, with sparse food supplies, was dedicated to the establishment of the permanent peace in the world, the welfare of the children, to the rights of the women, also ruthlessly destroyed by the Nazis, never to let it happen again, was their burning resolve. Our American delegation was amazed that we are so fearful that fascism, like the fabled phoenix, would arise again from its own ashes. On our home voyage via an army transport carrying out 5,000 returning GIs, we found that the desire for peace as eager as that of the European women. We will prove here that our work on behalf of peace is identical with the hopes and dreams of men and women all over the world, as well as the whole American people today. I wrote a series of 28 articles on these trips. The one the government has listed is, I Meet a Great Leader of France, published February 3rd of 1946. In the word current, and referring to a member and vice president of the French Assembly, a leader of the French resistance movement against the Nazis, a French communist leader, Jacques Duclos, you have heard his name from Mr. Lane. You will hear a great deal about the French communist who had written an article in the French communist magazine called Here's Du Communism in April of 1945, who was addressed to his French comrades. We will prove that they reconstructed, <coughs> reconstructed the party and our American delegation. I wrote a series of 20 articles on this trip. And we will also have proved that they had reconstructed their party officially on its emergence from the underground and were determined not to lose its identity on the popular united front, which had developed in the days of the resistance. While cooperating to the fullest for the re-establishment of the French Republic, they maintained their independent existence as the Communist Party of France. We will prove that this was a use as an example of the wrong way to work, the dissolution of the American Communist Party and the creation of the Communist Political Association which was analyzed in detail for the clarification of his French readers to counteract certain suggestions for discordation, which has been circulated there in France. But we will prove that his article, while it was sharp criticism of the American party, was not a directive nor an order. It stands to reason that such a characterization of our course as notorious revisionism, which came from a heroic fighter against Nazism, and a communist of the world renown caused us to give it our most serious attention, especially with this so. And we will prove, when it coincided with alarming developments with our own country, which conceived us with the capitalist, with alarming developments within our own country, which convinced us that the capitalist leopard had not changed its spots during the war, but was ready to resume class hostilities against American labor unions and our party. We will prove to you that a re-evaluation of our thinking of the actions had already begun in our party leadership, and even without the Duke article, although possibly not quite so swiftly, we would have reconstructed our party, which had existed since 1919. Interrupted only by an extremely short period of the few months of the Communist Political Association, we feel that we had a right to call upon the government to explain in the course of their accusations why the alleged danger emanating from our work was so clear and present that the Smith Act was needed in 1940? Why wasn't it used against our leadership until 1948 or against us? 
the present defendants until 11 years after this passage will prove that socialism was not on the agenda of the 1940 American political campaign, nor in 1944, nor in 1948, or even now in 1952, and therefore cannot be the real casuative factor for this indictment. We have publicly advocated socialism as our ultimate goal since the birth of our party 33 years ago, please remember. Now was the change of the force and violence a newly discovered issue. It was fought out heinously by the government for 16 years in the famous Schnellism case, which began in 1927 and which they lost before the Supreme Court in 1943. Three years after the Smith Act was passed, it was an attempt to cancel the citizenship of a leading communist. If our party needed reassurance of its legal rights, we felt it was certainly given by this decision. Justice Murphy wrote that opinion. I will quote to you half a portion of it, which to our party and to our country generally was understood to have laid low this false accusation of the force and violence once and for all, and to have reaffirmed our right to advocate our political views. This also cast light on our intent, which you must consider. The Supreme Court has before them four of the books produced here. And its quote has it as follows. A tenable conclusion from the foregoing is that the party in 1927 desired to achieve its purpose by peaceful and democratic means. As a theoretical matter, justified the use of the force and violence only as a method of preventing an attempted forcible counter overthrow once the party had obtained control in a peaceful manner, or as the counter overthrow once the party had obtained control in a peaceful manner, or as a method of the last resort to enforce majority will it at some indefinite future time because of the peculiar circumstances, constitutional or peaceful channels were no longer open. That is close of the Justice Murphy's quote. We'll prove that our party has repeatedly endorsed the statement as basically correct, though incomplete statement of our party's policy in the matter of force and violence. And William Z. Foster, our chairman, so stated a few years ago before the Senate Judiciary Committee. It is our contention that neither of these issues, neither socialism nor the charge of force and violence, should rightfully bring us before this jury on this indiction. They becloud the real issues which we are believe are to be primarily in our day-to-day -day activities, which are not peripheral or fringe activities as the government contends, but to the heart of our work, to fight against fascist tendencies in our country and to fight for peace is to us Marxism and Leninism in action. We believe that the struggle for peace and the democratic rights will soon lead to a new political alignment in our country which we believe will break through pattern of the two party systems and establish a new people's party, a coalition of which we would support. We will prove that what it is capitalism has existed only a comparatively short time in the United States, less than two centuries, and it is not identical to government. It is neither the first nor the last stage of human society. Only those who profit by it consider it the Alpha and Omega and the best of all possible conclusions. Before capitalism was feudalism, where the few lords owned the land and lived on the labor of their serfs. Before that, there was the chattel slavery, barbarism. Capitalism developed and supplanted feudalism with the advent of the power operated mass production machinery. It expanded rapidly, controlled by an ever smaller group as free competition was replaced by the monopoly. When we speak of the abolishing capitalism, we do not mean, of course, to abolish the rich natural resources of our country, nor the vast productive industries which we have developed by the labor of its people. We will prove that we mean abolishing the private ownership and the basic means of production and the profit-making system it endangers, which permits a few, the capitalist class, to exploit many. We mean that the natural resources and the mines, the mills, factories, railroads, means of communication shall be owned in common by all the people as state property to be administered by a government representing the working class, as well as all other people. We don't mean that personal or private property is abolished in those things which are the result of saving or personal use. What we will be abolished is the use of the private property to exploit the labor of another. For example, in a socialistic society, the principle applied would be from each ability to eat according to this work. 
which is identical with what St. Paul said to the Seolizations, but that anything could not work, neither should he eat. In a communist society as differentiated from the socialist society, with an abundance of everything needed in human life, development of comfort is assured. The principle would then be from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. This will be communism, the fulfillment, we believe, of an ideal human society, which we believe to be possible and desirable. An answer as to how we expect socialism will be brought about, in contradiction to the theory of force and violence, we will prove, as I have said, it cannot be the result of our efforts alone, but it can be the result of the action of the majority of the people of the United States when they are ready and willing to make such a change. We will show that we have simply and sincerely denounced in our constitution any group or party which conspires or acts or subverts, undermines, weaken or overthrow any or all institutions of the American democracy through which the majority of the American people can maintain their rights to determine their destinies. In relation to the future hypothetical question and situation in the United States, where an entrenched capitalist minority might be used to force to thwart the will of the people who voted for and who are ready to make the transition to socialism. This will be tyranny, and we will take the position that the people will be justified to use force to overthrow it. Just like our own government called upon the people of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy to overthrow the rules of terror against the people and aid the underground resistance movement in all fascist occupied countries. The communist position is what those who favor slavocracy opposed the abolition of human slavery in the past. It is quite possible that I die her capitalist minority might oppose the abolition of the capitalist profit system in the future. Here, as in England and elsewhere, we communists strive for a peaceful road to socialism. We will show that we will do everything in our power to prevent the use of force and violence in establishing socialism, which we will now full well cannot be undertaken here or elsewhere, unless it has the support of the majority of the people. But we cannot, of course, guarantee that the enemies of the people will accept the decision of the people to move to socialism. Socialism, however, is not yet on the order of the day. Let me repeat, in the United States, the minute political program of our party, we will prove, is anti-war and anti-fascist for a people's front government, a government dedicated to assure the well-being of the people. What will take place after that along the road to socialism in the United States of America is something history and the American people will determine, but which no one here blueprint. This brings me to my concluding remarks. We are here for you as the defendants in the Smith Art case. We will prove to you that we are not conspirators, but we are animated and united by the common ideals and aspirations of courage to affirm our benefits and our beliefs, faiths in our <clears throat> people and the future and a willingness to sacrifice for a better world, which we are confident is in the birth. Nevertheless, it is incumbent on the government, regardless of ideology unity, to deal with us as individuals, and not to lump us together as the conspiracy because of the identity of our political views. We will try to bring you a true and accurate picture of who we are, what our lives have been, what we say and mean, what we live by day by day, and the relation of all this immediate activity to our ultimate aims. We will try to present to you during this trial our series and work, our program, our ultimate goal, the unity of theory and practice as it says in the books. We will not do this in the classroom atmosphere, but so that you can understand this. We expect to convince you that we are within our own established constitutional rights to advocate change and progress, to advocate socialism, which we are convinced will guarantee to all our people in our great and beautiful country the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whether we are right is no issue here, and no jury in this or any other trial, but time alone will decide. Then none of us forget, especially in this trial and dealing with new ideas and proposals for the social change, 
the wise words of Abraham Lincoln. This country of its institutions belong to the people who inhabit it. We are asking you to decide this case on the evidence, or more correctly, may I say, on the lack of evidence, which we are confident we will be glaringly revealed long before that trial is over. To decide this case on the exact issues, regardless of the fear or favor on the hysteria or the prejudice which we all well know does exist among some groups in the community, we ask you to keep your minds open about all that evidence, including our own, is before you, that you will be shown that we do not advocate the overthrow of the government of the United States by force or violence. Thank you.